So thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Uh, we're pleased that we could all get together today um, to talk about something that gives all of us joy and hope in these times, which are Maine birds. We'll get started with our presentation in just a moment, but first a few introductions and uh, logistical items. So uh, we at the Natural Resources Council of Maine are a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 supporters statewide and beyond. For more than 60 years, NRCM has uh, been protecting the places and the way of, ways of life that make Maine so special. Um, before I introduce our hosts, Jeff and Allison, uh, a few uh, logistical items to go over uh, with the webinar this afternoon. Um, we are up to 140 participants. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are unable to see your video or hear your audio, um, and that's by design uh, because this is a webinar. Um, you'll be hearing from Jeff and Allison, our resident bird experts, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, if you have a question for our presenters today, um, you can use the question and answer box feature, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It's a little Q&A bubble. So if you have a question um, for our uh, presenters today, please use that feature, and we'll have plenty of time for question and answer after Jeff and Allison's presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded today, um, and we can share the, uh, the recording with you um, after this presentation today for you to watch at your convenience. Um, so today, our hosts are Jeff and Allison Wells. They'll be presenting with slides, sounds, and a few videos of popular Maine birds. Um, we'll have some fun poll questions interspersed throughout the presentation today to keep you all on your toes, um, and then we'll get to our questions. So, um, Allison Wells is the Senior Director of Public Affairs for the Natural Resources Council of Maine, and Jeff Wells is Vice President of Boreal Conservation for the National Audubon Society. They're both lifelong birders who began birding together when they met in college at Cornell. They write regularly together about birds, including in a column for the Booth Bay Register and a blog for NRCM. They've also written a number of books about birds, including Maine's favorite birds, devoted specifically to Maine birds and one many of you have a copy of. I'll just plug it here as a great resource for homebound kids and adults to learn about Maine birds and it can be ordered online through many stores. So here are Jeff and Allison Wells to share uh, about Maine's favorite birds. Okay. You gonna pull just that slide up? <laughs> yeah, just a second. We're gonna share our screen here if we can. Um, sorry. Here we go. All right. Good. Thanks, Todd. To. Thank you, Todd. This is our book, Maine's Favorite Birds. We hope um, you have it, and if you do have it, that you enjoy it and it's useful to you in some way. Um, we want to welcome everyone here, and thank you for inviting us into your kitchen, your living room, or wherever you happen to be tuning in today. We are thrilled to have you here in our kitchen. We'd hope to be maybe outside with our webinar, but it's very windy and not uh, very friendly for uh, microphones today. And then we thought, well, maybe we can set it up to view our feeders in the backyard, but again, the light was not quite right. So we're hoping that maybe the best case scenario, you can see the little puffin we have in the corner of the room up there. <laughs> um, uh, our feeders have been extremely busy right now. Uh, lots of birds, we've been seeing chickadees, uh, nuthatches, cardinals, and lots of goldfinches coming in. Uh, Jeff, what have you been noticing in particular? Well, uh, last week we had a surprise bird, a uh, northern mockingbird. Um, that's actually kind of rare for us. We've only seen them twice in 15 years uh, right around our, our neighborhood. So that was kind of cool. And actually this morning, uh, before it got really windy, um, we had a, a ruby crowned kinglet singing vigorously from the cedar tree in the neighbor's yard and uh, a yellow rump warbler, first one of those uh, for us that kind of flew over on uh, the early morning. Before we start our, our presentation about some of the birds that we're looking forward to seeing and hearing here, here in Maine, um, we want to put up our first poll question. 
so that we have something for all of you to, to weigh in on. We, we love poll questions and we hope that you do too. So we've got a couple of fun ones, they're all fun ones. Our first one is, among these four main bird species, which is your favorite? Black-capped chickadee, common loon, Atlantic puffin, or American robin? We'll fill you in on the poll results. Uh, Todd will come in with the data a little bit later, but uh, I'll just say that I love them all, but you can't pick them all, you have to pick one. And uh, don't be fooled by the fact that we have the puffin, yeah. you know, little <laughs> statue back there. It doesn't necessarily mean it's our favorite bird. But we do love them. That we do love them. Uh, before we go on to more slides, we want to just give a nod to a few of the people who've helped us discover our love of birds and nature. Um, you wanna to go to the next slide, Jeff? Yeah, there we go. So the woman in the left-hand corner here is my Nana. And I, I don't have any memories of her feeding wild birds from her hand, although apparently she did. One of my uh, relatives sent this photo to me fairly recently and I was delighted to see it. Uh, but what I do have very clear memories of is her calling me over to her kitchen window in, in Cooper's Mill, Mills over in Whitefield and showing me that what she called the wild canaries, which are these beautiful uh, male full breeding plumaged uh, American goldfinches and they just were just gorgeous. She called them wild canaries. And to this day, I still like to call them wild canaries in, earn, in honor of my Nana. My, my grandmother and my mother in particular um, also were really special for getting me into birds and nature. And down in the, the right hand corner here, there's a picture of me when I'm maybe, I don't know, three or four with my mother uh, trying to nurse, uh, I think a injured cat bird back to life. Um, and, um, you know, we, we talk about this because, uh, especially at this time right now, it's so important to be sharing that love of, of birds and nature with others around you, especially with kids. And we know many of you are, are doing that and we um, just sort of uh, encourage you and applaud you for, for all that. Yes, thank you for caring and sharing. Um, so this is Todd, before we go on, I'm just sharing the results of our first poll question. Jeff and Allison, can you see those results on your screen? Yes. yes, we can. Wow. And I have to say, shout out to me because that's exactly what I would have guessed. Common loon. Wow. Over 50% <laughs> of you say that the common loon's your favorite bird. Very cool. Very nice. You can't lose. There's no losers. These are all great birds. They're all beautiful and sing wonderful songs. Thank you for participating. Thank you for the results, Todd. Okay, nice. Well. Um, so as we know, Maine is a very special place and it's a special place for birds for many reasons. It's where southerly habitats meet uh, the great north. Uh, we have mountains and grasslands, wetlands and coastal areas, lakes and rivers that we all uh, love to enjoy ourselves. And they're also home to many, many bird species. In fact, more than 400 bird species have been recorded here in Maine. And not only do we have an incredible diversity of breeding bird species, but we also see massive numbers of migrants, birds that are passing through the state on their way north and south from Arctic and boreal regions to, to our north. Uh, perhaps the, the most iconic of Maine birds though, is this bird here. And of course, we've discovered it's also maybe the most fa the, the favorite bird. Um, and, you know, I think for so many people, this is kind of quintessential Maine. Um, and all of us probably have memories of the very first time, as a, especially as a kid, maybe hearing the, the call of a loon echoing over a lake. We're going to just try to play a call here and see if it comes through for all of you. beautiful sound. Um, and before we move off the slide, I just want to say thank you to uh, Jerry Monteau for sending us this lovely slide as part of our My, Me My Main This Week feature. <laughs> you really, really like I, that song. I, I, I love that set. <laughs> um, so this is one of my uh, personal favorite main birds, the white-throated sparrow. It's a handsome little guy with his white uh, bow tie but you may recognize it more readily by its song, which to me is the quintessential sound of the Maine woods. We like to think that it says, Old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Do we have a song that does? Yes, we do. 
My Canadian friends, though, tell me that they say, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. But anyway, what, what do you think? Either way, it's a, it's a beautiful sound. Um, so, you know, it, it's just quintessential Maine, just like the, the loon too, even if people don't know what the bird is that's making that sound. Another bird that is very characteristic of Maine, but a lot of people don't realize it, is this beauty, the Blackburnian warbler. Um, these winter in the mid elevational uh, uh, range of the Andes Mountains of northern South America. Um, and they certainly look more tropical than what many of us think of as uh, Maine birds. Um, they'll be arriving in, in May and settling into the tall spruce trees that they, that they like. Um, Maine actually is estimated to harbor over 15% of the entire world population of Blackburnian warblers. But many people in Maine have never seen one. That's because they're small. They're sort of smaller than your fist. Uh, smaller than a chickadee. They stay up at the very top of tall spruce trees and their song is so high-pitched that many people can't even hear it at all. So just to reiterate, what, what, when we talk about Maine having special responsibility for birds like the black Bernie and warbler, what we mean is that our state supports much of the breeding population. Uh, another bird in that category is the black-throated blue warbler, another one of our beautiful favorite birds. Uh, Maine is home to at least 20 percent of the world's black-throated blue warblers, just amazing. Uh, these birds winter in the greater Antilles of the Caribbean and will be arriving here in Maine in May. Uh, they nest in Maine's abundant beach forest and they have a buzzy sound that sounds like, uh, I'm so lazy, uh, uh, or zoo, 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 if you can't hear the I'm so lazy. Oh, oh. They do it better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who live in Maine may um, sometimes forget how special it is to see flocks of these birds along our coasts all year round. Maine is one of the only states uh, in the lower 48 where you can actually see eiders easily, commonly uh, in, in winter and, and in summer. Um, these are unusual ducks because they're tied completely to a marine environment, unlike, you know, the, the mallard, say, or the black duck, which can be in saltwater or freshwater. Eiders are only found in um, along the coast in salt water. Um, the males, um, this that bold black and white, we sometimes call them the salt and pepper ducks. Um, and then the females, of course, with that, those muted sort of some peachy brown colors that are, are just so gorgeous. Um, and I know so many Mainers, many of you probably live, who live along the coast are really um, watch for the young fluffy nestlings that are gonna start appearing in, in May and June um, all along the coast. So uh, we heard the results of our last poll question, so maybe we want to put another one out there. Um, I'm going to put Jeff on the spot with this next one and ask him to do his best attempt at a barred owl imitation without any warm-up. Then we'll play you a video uh, from many, many years ago of our son and his friend explaining how to identify a barred owl, and you can tell us which one you think is more entertaining. Okay, I'm going to uh, turn away from the mic here so I don't really blow you out and I apologize for <clears throat> where this might be. I shouldn't, you know, still I hope you do vote for me, but. crowds and we can't find each other or see each other that's what we do across across the room we do it like oh. that and we know where each other is oh I'm oh just gosh kidding. um so you're going to play that video yes now we're going to play that video um okay get ready for this what does the bar dog sound like that? <laughs> That's a tough, that's a tough competition. I don't know. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the poll is live now. We'll see. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Look at that. Looks like I'm losing. <laughs> I think some people are feeling sorry for you. Oh, I'm catching up. <laughs> um, 
maybe we'll see if we can move on to the next one while we're watching that. If I can get it to go here. Oh, sorry. Our, our coastlines and lakes are um, pretty famous for the fish populations that are starting to come back that support um, some amazing, spectacular birds like, um, like ospreys. See here catching an alewife. Um, and uh, eagles, bald eagles. Um, I know many of you, like us, probably have your favorite places to watch the ospreys and eagles come back to, to their nests. Um, we just had our ospreys return to Gardner here just last week, and already over the past week, we've been watching them going over the neighborhoods carrying great big sticks to the nests. Um, and even over the last month or so, we've been um, monitoring bald eagle nests along the Kennebec that we know of that, uh, and seeing them um, sitting on the nests. And I'm sure that's, a, that's something that most of you or many of you also enjoy doing. Speaking of very cool nesting birds, we have to mention the Atlantic puffin. Uh, look at that beautiful, beautiful bird. Uh, as many, and many of you have seen one of these in, in person out on Eastern Egg, Egg Rock, uh, having gone with NRCM on our annual puffin cruise with the Hardy boat out of New Harbor. Uh, we would love to be able to do it this year again. We had hoped to be able to do it. We would planned on it, but uh, given the social distancing requirements, we probably will not be able to, but we will keep you informed if that changes. Uh, meanwhile, here's a fun fact for you about puffins. Did you know that Maine is the only state in the U.S. where Atlantic puffins breed? And that Eastern Egg Rock is the southernmost breeding location. That's thanks to our good friend Steve Kress of the National Audubon Society's Project Puffin for his decades of restoration work out there. He's really done some amazing things. Yes, and uh, it's good to know that those puffins are out there doing their thing, even if we may not be able to get out there to see them. Um, but something that we all can see, even in our backyards, is the uh, magic of migration. Um, as I said earlier, Maine plays host to an amazing diversity of, of migrants, especially warblers, which are kind of the, the gems, the brightly colored gems of, of migration. Um, of course, the bulk of them arrive in May, but some have already been starting to arrive. I mentioned us seeing the yellow rump warbler this, this morning. I know others around the state are seeing those. Others have been seeing palm warblers. We haven't seen one yet. Um, pine warblers, we've had those in a number of places around. And the different species will just start uh, adding up here as we get closer and closer to May until there's sort of a flood of all of these different um, warblers, these brightly colored gems to be able to see in our backyards and, and uh, sort of neighborhoods and, and other areas. Well, the warblers may be the show-offs. Uh, and we love them all, every one of them. We love a show off. Hey, why not? Um, but Maine's migratory birds includes all types. We've got waterfowl like bufflehead, common golden eye, uh, northern pintail, shorebirds like the greater yellow legs, which we just saw in a field uh, over this past week, surprisingly, and solitary sandpipers. We've got sparrows, thrushes, bitterns, orioles. It's so exciting. That's what makes birding so much fun is you just never know what you're going to see when and where. Yeah, and every morning it's it's different. Um, and the reason for that is that most birds migrate at night. So literally, they have just arrived first thing in the morning. That ruby crowned king that we had outside probably had just been migrating all night long. That yellow rump warbler had been migrating all, all, all night long. Um, they stop during the day to feed and rest and um, get ready for the next night. And then they do another um, night migration. And literally millions of birds make this wave, the sea of, of migration that happens at night. You can actually go out and hear it on a good night, especially in like in May when there's a lot of birds and you hear these little chip notes. Um, some people think they sound probably like little insect sounds or something like that. Um, but some of them sound um, uh, a little bit more robust. There's one bird called the Swainson's thrush that makes a sound that sounds just like a spring peeper, except it's way up in the sky. So you know there's no frog up there and you could be hearing those going over later in May. You can even, if you have a telescope or binoculars, you can look at the moon on those nights if it's, if it's full or nearly full and sometimes see the birds zipping across the face of the, of the moon, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, but not all birds migrate at night. Some birds do migrate during the day. Um, thinking of hawks and eagles and osprey. Yeah, and you know, with some of the recent um, 
tracking studies using satellite technology and other new technologies. We've been finding out about some of these amazing migratory connections um, from the birds that are, are nesting in, uh, in our area. These are actually some tracks on the right here of birds that were tracked from uh, Massachusetts down to places, you know, all the way down into South America where they wintered, where those birds are, instead of catching alewives, they're catching, you know, tropical fish like this. This is a, a stunning photograph from our friend Mikhail Overstegen from Aruba, just off of South America where ospreys winter. Um, other birds like, um, you know, black pole warblers um, uh, are also make these amazing migrations. These are birds that are going to start showing up in late May in our area. They breed um, in that, that orange area in the map from Maine all across the boreal forest of Canada and go all the way down to South America to winter and then make the, their way back um, north again. So just some amazing, amazing migrations that we're just starting to learn about through some of the, um, some of the new research. Let's see, another bird that we are expecting to hear in a couple of weeks and you'll hear it in every woodlot in the state um, is, is this bird. It's called the oven bird. Um, AKA the teacher bird. Yes, because of its song. And we'll play you the song here. Um, uh, the, the teacher bird part of it is really great for teaching kids about. Here, so listen to the song. Teacher, teacher, teacher. teacher. And they're a bird that winters down in Central America, Caribbean, a little bit of Florida. You can see in the blue in that uh, inset map. And then they come up to our area for, um, for the summer. They should be arriving within a few weeks. Great. Uh, Todd, you have the results of the poll that we did, uh, putting Jeff up against our, our, bir our barred owl experts. Ooh, wow. Oh my gosh. Very close. That is so close. But the kids went out. I think you got the out. sympathy vote. I, yeah, probably the sympathy <laughs> vote because I think I would have voted for the kids too. Kids got 52% and my imitation 49%. Thank you for those who voted did, for me. You did me. a very good imitation. It's just that, you know, kids are really cute and those kids, kids are, are very, yeah. you know, they know their birds. So. They, they are. They were good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so since we've been talking about migrants, we thought our next poll question should be about a migrant species that has been recently returning to Maine in, in good numbers, the Eastern Phoebe. Uh, so we'd like to know how many of you have already seen a Phoebe, an Eastern Phoebe yet this year? Have you seen one this spring? And remember the Phoebe is, the, you saw the picture of it up there in the screen. It's a flycatcher that makes the sound like its name, Phoebe. It sounds maybe a little bit more like Phoebe, Phoebe. It wags its tail, likes to nest underneath your roof or uh, maybe in a shed or a garage under the eaves. So we, we, recently, we recently did a little social distance birding, a little familiar loop we do along the river and we saw five in one little stretch of area. So we know that they're, they're coming back in strong numbers. Perhaps you've seen one. Yeah. Whoops. I'm going to try to get to the next picture here if I can figure out how to do it. And while you're answering that poll question, we're going to shift gears and talk about some of the favorite year-round residents that we have, um, especially in kind of the, the southern half of Maine, where they're a bit more common. This is, of course, a northern cardinal. Um, and, you know, for so many people, it gives that, you know, joy when you get to see one, maybe in particular on a snowy day, like, like in this picture here, that bright red. Uh, Many people don't realize that uh, cardinals are relative newcomers to the state. Um, the first breeding wasn't until 1969. And before about 1950, uh, most of the records were considered to be most likely from um, escaped cage birds because people kept them as cage birds more commonly back in those days. An interesting tidbit that we just sort of found out about is that one of the very first records in the state was actually from our hometown of Gardner here in 1895. So while we're at it, we want to throw up another poll question. Um, I'm not sure if we can do this until we see the end of the result. Todd will tell us this. We want to see how many people have had cardinals around their um, home or, or neighborhood in the, last, in the last year. Okay, so we got that one running too. Good. Also want to give a shout out to Pam Wells for her beautiful My Maine This Week photo of this, this Northern Cardinal. Um, Pam is no relation, but I wish I had her talent for photos. 
uh, let's see, we, I think, are going to see again. You have a little video can, of a hard noise? Yeah, we've got a little video here, one in our yard. I hope that might have showed for some of you. Really, Cardinal just belting it out um, uh, in our in our yard. Wow, look at that. Wow. It's looking like a lot of people have seen a cardinal. Okay, well, we'll give them a few more minutes give to you a answer. a few more minutes. And while we talk about another bird that we see here in Maine year-round, uh, the tufted titmouse. You may be surprised to learn that there, were all, there was only a single record of a tufted titmouse in the state before 1950 or so. I remember how excited Jeff and I were when we heard about one that was being seen in Winthrop, where we were living at the time. Um, a lot of as many of us birders will go chasing after looking for birds that are rare uh, or that we haven't seen before or that are rare to the state. Well, believe it or not, tufted titmouse fit into that category way back when. Uh, now there's a lot more of them, um, but it's interesting how these uh, populations have changed over time. Yeah, I think that was in the maybe in the 1980s, early mm -hmm. 1980s, and now they're just a familiar bird we have just um, in, in every feeder in the area. Um, both cardinals and titmice, of course, are thought to be birds that have been able to move north because of climate change kind of ameliorating uh, winter conditions that have allowed uh, them to, to, uh, to push their way north. Um, should we check with Todd about the results of our Phoebe question? How many people have seen an Eastern Phoebe yet this year? Yes, Todd. Have you seen or heard an Eastern Phoebe? Oh, interesting. 53%, yeah. Just over 50% hmm. of you have had a had a Phoebe already, but yeah. still significant numbers haven't. So still, still have the anticipation. Still have the anticipation, <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm going to minimize that and go to the next slide if I can here. Uh, so speaking of, of migrants, this is a bird we mentioned earlier. Um, we wanted to share uh, a migrant that just has arrived in our yard and started um, singing. And this is, I'm sure you recognize a white foot sparrow. It's a song sparrow behind it. And there he's, and a neighbor's roofing project, unfortunately. Sorry about that. He's gonna sing one more time here. It's not a beautiful sound and you know we came down the other day in the morning to breakfast and one was singing um, uh, and it was just so beautiful to, to hear. Um, and beautiful to see. I don't know if you guys can see this or not but in the sparrow's eye you can see our house reflected. And I just think that's such an interesting image. I don't you know, this is one we had at our at our feeder. Yeah, um, just uh, beautiful. Such a beautiful bird. Um, we like to make sure uh, sightings like this are put into something called eBird, for those of you who don't know about it. Um, and eBird is a online tool that allows you to put in bird sightings from anywhere, any place, any species, any one, um, and to have those sightings be used for science. Um, you can actually get an app on, uh, to put on your phone, so you can actually do it in the field very easily, or you can do it through, through the eBird website. Um, eBird was started more than 15 years ago by Audubon and Cornell, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, and is now run by, um, the Cor by Cornell. And one of the fun things that the uh, Cornell Lab has done with the eBird data is to make these maps that show the movements of the entire population of birds based on eBird data. And so here's a, a white-throated sparrow map that they did. Um, and I'm going to start it moving in animation. This is where uh, they winter, and you can see a few scattered in Maine here that, that winter, and I'm going to start the animation. I'm going to try to stop it if I can in April. Oh, I missed it, but okay, we, we switched right through to May, but you can see how the population sort of jumps north starting in that late April um, and then continues all the way to their breeding grounds so that by the summer, they're just sort of from Maine all the way across uh, much of Canada. And then the population in the fall moves back south again. And you can access maps like these at any time 
yourself through uh, through eBird. It's really amazing how far uh, eBird has come. I remember having uh, meetings and discussions around a conference room table when we were both back at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, trying to decide what we thought this tool should be, what it should be called, how it should work. And, and now look at it, it's amazing. Yeah, to go from uh, not having any name at all to now being okay. kind of a, a household name for many birders, eBird. So. Um, this seems like a good time to check in with Todd about the results of that cardinal poll. Todd, how many people have had cardinals the past year? Wow, a lot. 90% of you have had cardinals around your house or neighborhood in the last year. So wow. Cardinals are yeah. doing well, doing I would well. say. Um, well, if you haven't already, feel free to start typing in some questions or comments using the chat feature that uh, Todd mentioned. And um, while you're doing that, uh, Jeff has a little quiz bird for you. We won't ask you to fill out, fill out a poll, but if you want to type it into the chat, see if you know what it is. Uh, here it is. Uh, it's a bird that's just started arriving over the past week and it's wintering, it's wintering ground is the southeastern U.S. and the greater Antilles. Um, and one of the identifying features is it wags its tail up and down a lot. So this bird, you can see the beautiful yellow undersides, the, uh, that rusty cap, um, again, a bird that likes to stay kind of low to the ground, is a palm warbler. It's named for the kinds of vegetation that you find it in on the wintering grounds, in other words, palm trees, but it's actually a bird that comes up and nests in um, in northern peat bogs. Um, we sometimes joke that it should be called, you know, the bog warbler or something like that. Um, like that. And we have another one of the uh, animated uh, eBird maps to show you that uh, you can see the, uh, the, the wintering grounds here in the southern, southeastern U.S., Florida, and the, the greater Antilles. Um, and then I'll start the animation and, um, and you can see, I'm gonna try to, again, see if I can stop it in April. In April, suddenly the population zooms up, which is kind of close to where we are now in time. Um, um, you know, they just start moving north. And then if we continue it, whoops, I started it over again here, but it's gonna go all the way up and then you see where they are in their breeding grounds up north and now heading back south again. So. That's the palm. It's pretty cool. Warbler. Um, let's see, where are we? Um, do we want to do a, another poll question? Oh yeah. Quiz? Okay. Yeah, this is a good poll question, I think. Okay. Um, so we've given you so I've talked about a number of birds, shared a lot of songs with you. Um, so we thought it would be fun to see how many people were paying attention. What bird song is said to sound like Old Sam Peabody Peabody Peabody? Is it? White crowned sparrow, palm warbler, tufted titmouse, or the white throated sparrow. Which bird sounds like old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody? And out of there, there. Yeah, and don't be fooled by, you know, any trick questions in there that I might have thrown in. <laughs> well, they do want some of you to be fooled. I think a few <laughs> of you have, by the looks of it. So, do we have uh, any questions, Todd? that we should think about answering while people are taking this poll quiz. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, many thanks to Jeff and Allison for this great presentation today. We have many questions from folks who are joining us today. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's find a question here. Bear with me. Um, so, um, one question is, what kind of predators do these birds that you've uh, shared with us today, what kind of predators do they face here in Maine? Are there any birds of prey that prey on these, um, these birds? Yes, well, if you have a bird feeder uh, and you're in the right place, you might get visited by a sharp shin hawk or a cooper's hawk uh, that like to come in and feed on the little songbirds that like to feed at your feeder. In fact, we had a goshawk come in once, believe it or not. Um, yeah, the goshawks are usually, they're the biggest of the so-called bird-eating hawks, the occipiters. They uh, typically feed on grouse. That's their main mainstay in the woods, but occasionally one will come out and look for other prey. 
Um, but there are a set of birds who um, have evolved just to, to feed on almost exclusively on birds. Another one uh, is the Merlin, a falcon, uh, which uh, winters more regularly in Maine than it used to and now breeds in Maine. Um, and it, it never used to, at least a few decades ago. Um, and of course, peregrine falcons, often we see them around um, cities eating pigeons and they will also take, take ducks. So there, yeah, there's a whole set of them. Some of the other hawks will occasionally um, take uh, birds, although they, you know, things like red-tailed hawks might be more likely to take small mammals and broad-winged hawks like frogs and snakes. Um, but, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a set of them. And then of course, there are other pred non-avian predators, um, uh, you know, raccoons and uh, possums and foxes will take bird eggs and nests. Even people are surprised, but red squirrels and gray squirrels will actually take nestlings and eggs uh, of birds. So there's a, a lot of those. And we have actually heard the very odd situation that white-tailed deer uh, have taken, eaten birds that have been stuck in mist nets for some strange reason. Mist nets are where you catch birds to ban them. And um, we've had this really odd situation where a couple times uh, birds got caught in those nests and before the researchers could get to them to take them out, the deer had actually eaten the birds. So who knows, some, some things are odd that way. <laughs> That's nature. <laughs> Um, Susanna Adams asks, is there a way to identify a recorded bird call online? Is there an online resource to ID a bird call? We all have our favorites. I think Jeff is the one that really uses this the most. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think if the Merlin app has, is, has a sound feature too. There's, a, there's a, uh, an app called Merlin that the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has that allows you to um, put in uh, bird uh, photographs and I think sounds um, to help you identify them. There are a number of um, different uh, commercial programs that have been put out there to actually um, identify the sounds of birds and um, I'm, I'm not sure which ones are free. Um, so I have to, I'm, I can't answer that quickly without a little bit of Google searching to see which, what's available, but probably one of the best places to check first is uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology and their Macaulay Library of Natural Sounds. They're some of the world's experts in, in that. Um, and I would check the Merlin app to see if that has a sound identification feature as part of it. There are, we should say that there are lots of, um, uh, uh, apps and programs and, and different ways of learning bird sounds. Um, I know Audubon has some different um, uh, web features and uh, different things that help you to, to sort out different sounds. There's a lot of different productions that help you uh, kind of group birds by how what ones sound similar and to help you figure them out. Great. Um, so Aaron in Sabatis asks, uh, an eagle's nest we just uh, watched was knocked out of our, a tree during the recent snow and windstorms. We saw one of the eagle return a few days after the windstorm, but now we haven't seen them again. The question is, will the eagles rebuild the nest, or will they build another nest in the area, or are they gone altogether? And finally, um, when do uh, eagles uh, lay eggs uh, here in Maine? Well, we're seeing eagles on nests now. Uh, on our regular tool that I mentioned earlier down the river, we've seen a number of uh, nests that we, we look at. We actually check on them year-round just to see how they're holding up in the weather. But we see that we put up our spotting scopes at a safe distance and we can see the white heads of the adults sitting on the nest. So we know that they're already nesting. Uh, do you want to talk about um, what would happen with the nests? Yeah, well, I mean, it'll be an interesting thing for you to watch and see what happens, yeah. of course. But, um, you know, I think we, it's hard to predict, but all of those things are possibilities if the tree is still have, has a good place to put a very big and heavy nest, um, then they might go back to that one, or they may look for another one. But they will certainly try to stay in that same area. You know, they, there's enough eagles around now that if you try to uh, go into a, a new spot, you're going to, you know, immediately get into a fight with the territorial pair next door. So 
they'll probably, since they've already had their territory sort of staked out, they'll probably try to find a spot within that same area to, to build a nest, whether it's the same tree or, you know, another big tall tree that can hold those big heavy nests. Great. So Jeff Lockwood asks, are Orioles arriving earlier to Maine due to climate change or do they arrive at a specific time each year? Well, um, most birds now are arriving on average about two weeks earlier than they used to in a, around 1950. So birds are arriving earlier. Um, Orioles are, you know, probably among those that would be arriving a couple, at least a couple of weeks earlier. And it seems like, you know, every year we keep hearing more and more people say, oh, I've had this much earlier than I ever had one before. Um, you know, so sometimes the way that we remember um, when they would arrive, the dates, um, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of already off a little bit. So um, I'm trying to think, I, I don't think anybody has reported an Oriole that I remember on the listserv yet this year, but um, you know, I won't be surprised if in, in you know, any time, even this week, that somebody may report an Oriole from, from somewhere in Maine, um, even though the bulk of them may not come back until you know, sometime later in May. Hmm. Um, an interesting recount um, from E. Simmons. I recently witnessed an eagle take a male eider in Casco Bay. He swam it to shore. Is this common in Maine? Well, eagles will take um, a lot of uh, different you know, creatures, I mean, they're pretty omnivorous almost, you know, they, that's why we see them at dumps, you know, for those who've been over to some of the dumps and seen all kinds of eagles, you know, they'll, they'll eat almost anything. Of course, live prey is probably preferred. And I, I've heard stories of them catching different um, things like um, squid, for example, that were too big uh, to, um, to sort of pull out of the water or some kind of a fish and actually just sort of paddling their way to shore um, and then, and then, you know, dragging it up on shore so they could eat it. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, they're, they're very clever birds and will, will kind of get anything that, um, is, is available. Should we go on to oh, the Oh yeah, we can do the poll question now. Um, so the question was, which bird, uh, sings the song that says, Oh, Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. And Jeff did throw a little bit of a ringer in there with the white crowned sparrow, uh, and it did get some votes. But the correct answer is the white throated sparrow. Yeah, white crowned sparrow. You know that was that was a that was a ringer. But they actually say something slightly different. They say jam jam feed the ants, or some derivation of that. A little bit of a buzzier sound, and they tend to come later. So they tend to come, you know, the beginning of of May. We haven't had any in our area yet. Um, and they tend to go uh, all the way even further north. They breed further north. So they have white stripes, white and black stripes on the head also, but they don't have a white throat. Um, so watch for those in the next you know, week or two. And of course, palm warbler, tuft of titmouse. Um, I just threw those in because we talked about them to see what you did. But glad to see that most people got that one, <laughs> got that one right. Do we have uh, another um, bird question? We do, yeah. So Kathy in Caribou asks, are golden eagles ever seen in Maine? If so, where? Well, um, yes, they are seen in Maine. They migrate through in winter in Maine. They used to breed in Maine um, and they became fewer and fewer over the years until um, they are not not nesting um, currently as, as far as we know. Um, but the most of the birds that we have here are birds that breed up in northern Quebec and, and Labrador and come down for the winter. And so very occasionally we people will, will find one. Um, they're a lot harder to identify than most people realize. Sometimes people think that golden eagles are larger than bald eagles. And so they see a large eagle and they'll say, oh, that's a golden eagle. But it turns out actually golden eagles are a little bit smaller than bald eagles. And young bald eagles take four to five years to reach adulthood. And they during that time, they have white patches in the wings and white in the in the tail, so they have a plumage which is very similar to um, to golden eagles. So um, birders, even expert birders, find it sometimes quite hard to tell them apart. So just be cautious if you 
think you see a golden eagle, you want to check very carefully, um, you know, to 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 learn um, the the ways to tell them apart from um, a young bald eagle. But yes, we do have them, and probably they're um, in in winter in migration. There's probably a bit more than we know because you know it's not easy to find them. Great. Um, so Mary Grace Barber asks, can you talk a bit about current hawk migrations? Sure. Well, um, yeah, so hawks start migrating, some of them, even as early as, um, as February, believe it or not, red-shouldered hawks, which are one of the hawks that winter the furthest north in the U.S., start coming back in, uh, in, in February. Uh, a few of them, and then continue on into March. And then you kind of go through a whole series of other other hawks, um, uh, you know, goshawks and eagles tend to nest, uh, tend to, to migrate uh, pretty early. Um, right now, there's large numbers, relatively large numbers of things like uh, Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin hawks are starting to, to build up in numbers. There's some been a big push of broad wing hawks. There's a um, a hawk watch that's staffed at Bradbury Mountain State Park uh, through the efforts of Farrak and Jeanette Lovich. Um, and they, um, uh, you know, that's been going on for quite a few years. So they give a regular update on, on the main birds listserv and what's going through. Um, so you can see what's, what's happening. There are lots of great places to look for hawks. Uh, we did an NRCM trip to- yep. Mount Agamenicus down in Southern Maine. Yeah. Got some great hawks there. Um, and there's places, lots of other places um, to look for uh, hawks. But if you are in any kind of a high spot or place along the coast, um, you can look um, sort of some of the last hawks that move through in May uh, tend to be merlins and peregrine falcons. Um, uh, they follow that great bird migration north. Um, so, you know, they sort of, you know, have to move with their food. So they tend to move during the period of greatest songbird migration. Great. Um, good question here from Toby. Um, is there a resource you would recommend to learn how to improve bird habitat in one's urban or suburban yard? So question about uh, in improving habitat in, uh, in uh, an urban or a suburban setting for birds. Well, there is a lot of yeah. online resources. I mean, some stuff is pretty basic. Like, do you really have to have a humongous lawn? You know, I mean, if, if you're allowed to by your codes in your town, Maybe you let a little more of your lawn go wild. You know, I mean, that's just that provides great places for insects to breed, and that's what that's what birds eat. A lot of birds eat that. And uh, when you're going to be planting your gardens or putting plants around, make sure that they're native Maine hmm. plants. Those are one of some of the best things you can do uh, for our birds. Do you have a brush pile? You know, brush, brush piles pile, are yeah. great. Uh, main, leaving leaving leaves and things like that, so um, you kind of encourage places for there to be insects and worms and things. Uh, you know, not cutting off dead limbs if you can, if they're not over your house, for example. So you can have places for woodpeckers and leaving, um, uh, you know, trees that maybe are somewhat diseased or something. So lots of things like that. There are various books and web online web resources um, for that. And um, I know Audubon has kind of uh, a, some some great resources for that on the Audubon website. Um, we mentioned Steve Kress before. He's written a number of books about backyard kind of uh, landscaping for birds. You could look into those. Um, but again, starting off with a lot of those um, ideas that, that Allison mentioned would, would be uh, a, great, a great place to start. Excellent. I would also add to that, um, putting out a, uh, a bird bath is a great way to attract birds to your yard, especially on hot summer days when it's not e always easy for them to, to find uh, water sources that are convenient for them. Um, in fact, as we've been sitting here watching, I've been sitting here giving our, our presentation and talking with all of you and watching a number of birds visiting our bird bath out there. A couple of chickadees have showed up and the female cardinals made an appearance. So that's just a nice little addition to anything else that you want to do to improve your yard for birds. Did you have any of uh, those birds out there? I did have one of these, a couple of these birds out here. They weren't as, uh, they weren't wearing their carnival gear, their carnival costumes, as Chef likes to call uh, this particular plumage. Uh, we thought it'd be fun to throw another quiz out there for you. Uh, Jeff found this photo in our stash. 
And we're wondering, you know, we won't throw this out as a poll question, but um, give you a chance to think about what this might be. Yes, it's a bird that um, we like to sometimes call them the potato chip bird because they make a sound mm -hmm. as they're flying. They have this undulating flight and they say potato chip, potato chip. And they kind of look like a potato chip with the, you know, the yellow at least. I would never eat a potato chip that looks like this, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know what it is, Todd? Just to put you on the spot? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, <laughs> we gotcha, huh? No. <laughs> Okay. I, I don't know. That is an American goldfinch, but you'll probably remember it as the potato chip bird from here on out. <laughs> I bet. But it's in an in-between plumage. I mean, it's a this little is, bit of a trick question. This is a male that's molting from <clears throat> its um, from its winter to its to its summer plumage. Did Charles Darwin call it the the potato chip bird too? Or uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sure we could track that down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have a, a few more minutes for a few more questions. If you have any last questions, please get them in in the, the Q&A box here. Um, question from Kate about kestrels. Um, are kestrels in Maine year round and what do they feed on? No, for the most part, they're not year round. Occasionally a bird will sort of try to linger, you know, an, an individual or two. But um, for the virtually all of them leave. Unfortunately, kestrels are one of the species that's really declined heavily in in Maine and really throughout their range. Um, they're birds that like open uh, grasslands and and sort of shrubland edges, and they really in the in the summer especially they feed a lot on on insects. You know, large you'll see them eating large grasshoppers and things like that, um, but also small snakes and um, occasional small mice and things like like that. Um, they've just been coming back for us, at least in our area, we've just started seeing them over the last maybe week or two in a couple of spots. We only have a couple spots where we have any, any left around here actually. Um, and then, you know, they sort of uh, usually have departed by um, October or so. Um, and then we don't see them the rest of the year. So yeah, very cool birds. Excellent. Um, a question here um, about Maine's favorite birds. Um, if you were to do an update to the Maine's favorite bird book, uh, would you choose the same 100 birds? I think we would choose the same 100 birds, but I think we would add to it. <laughs> it would be more than 100 birds. Um, yeah. We talked about some things that we would add to it. There's a few birds that, you know, people have mentioned. And of course, there are some birds that people don't see that often in your, you know, just in your backyard and things, you know, offshore waters, or if you go up into the northern forests, but there's still birds that are special to Maine, and we might include a few more of those, um, you know, there's things like, um, you know, rough grouse and even spruce grouse, that's a very mm -hmm. specialty bird, but, um, um, and things like uh, Canada jay and um, maybe a few birds like um, great egrets that, you know, people see in southern Maine. So, you know, there's a few uh, little things here and there um, that we, you know, a snowy egret, I guess, is another. So we've had people mention different ideas what they think we should, we should do. And maybe we, maybe we will try to do one of those at some point. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. A couple more questions here. Um, Marsha Baker asks, how is the bobolinks population doing here in Maine? Yeah, bobolinks are um, a, a blackbird that um, has a very unusual um, cycle. They nest only in grasslands and hay fields, and they go all the way down to southern South America to the pampas grasslands of Argentina um, and 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 near some areas nearby there um, for for the winter. Um, so they have this amazing migration cycle. And because they tend to nest in hay fields in, in our area especially, um, they have been susceptible to the earlier and earlier mowing that we've been seeing. Um, so because they're a bird that migrates from very far south, they don't have many cues to tell them to come back earlier. So they come back about the same time that they always did, but our grassland hay fields are maturing and growing quicker 
So um, they tend to get harvested earlier. Plus there's some new hay varieties that allow uh, farmers to mow earlier. So a lot of times the birds get back and they've just laid their eggs in their little ground nests and those nests get destroyed as the, as the field gets mowed. So grassland birds of all sorts are among the most uh, rapidly de declining across the U.S. from both loss of habitat and from things like like what I just described in bobolinks are among them. So if you have bobolinks, it's pretty special. If you have a situation where it's possible to delay the mowing of a field, um, then you know that's a great thing. Sometimes farmers can't do that because um, they lose so much nutritional value of the hay so quickly that they would lose tens of thousands of dollars if they're using it for that purpose. But there are places where people just have hay fields for other reasons. And if you can delay mowing of those, to give the birds a chance to actually get the young off, you know, that's a great, a great thing. Excellent. So let's make this our last question before we do our closing. A uh, question from Pat Wright. Do goldfinch winter over in southern Maine or am I seeing other finches or a pine siskin? It's hard to tell when, uh, when they don't have their summer colors. Uh, goldfinches do overwinter here in Maine. They don't have that beautiful gold color, or the males don't anyway, uh, but they are here year round. Uh, they may sh shift their ranges a little bit. I'm not sure how much. Some, some portion of the population goes further south, but there's always uh, some that stay all winter in Maine. You can have pine siskins as well, yeah. but they look pretty different. They're just streaked with brown. Um, they don't have that any of that sort of greenish or gold or yellowish um, yellowish hue um, and of course some years we get red poles which are very similar in size to siskins and goldfinches but they are coming down from um, arctic and boreal regions just usually every other year we have a kind of a, a, a movement and eruption of those into the state so yes you'll have goldfinches all year round um, probably more of them now we had them all year round but we had this big influx over the last month or so, including those really wacky colored males that are sort of molting back into their summer plumage. Excellent. Well, before we close, we would like to just um, give everyone something that they can do for birds, something specific. Uh, if you love birds, and I think we all do, uh, you probably want to do what you can to make sure that there's a lot of habitat around for them for years to come for our kids and grandchildren and uh, those in our lives that are special. Um, oops. Well, birds need habitat and one way to ensure that they have it is to support the Land for Maine's future program. LMF, as it's called, purchases uh, special lands for a variety of reasons, um, recreation, uh, all kinds, all, just enjoyment, photography, uh, but also wildlife for wildlife, for breeding and uh, other uses. Um, but the program is out of funding now. So this was a high priority for NRCM this past legislative session was to get a bond passed uh, to, put on the, um, to put on the November ballot. Uh, but the efforts were stymied due to the need for this to stay at home from COVID. So um, Todd, do you wanna just give a quick update on where, that, uh, where we are with that in the legislature? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Allison mentioned, the, the Maine State Legislature adjourned early uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, many of the bills that NRCM had been working on, including the Land for Maine's Future Bond, which is LD911, um, was left in limbo. Um, and so the bill uh, and many other bills like it are um, waiting for the legislature to return for a special legislative session. Um, if that happens later this spring or this summer or even the fall, um, we, we hope that the legislature will prioritize um, passing LD 911 to put um, a Land for Maine's Future bond on the ballot this November to let Maine voters um, uh, vote, uh, vote on the bond. Um, every time an LMF bond has been on the ballot, it's passed uh, with overwhelming popularity uh, because uh, it uh, is Maine's most successful uh, conservation program and helps protect lots of habitat for, for Maine's birds. So um, please take action on our action alert and ask your legislators to support LMF if and when they return um, for a special legislative session. Yes. This is a picture actually from one of the first places that was purchased with the very first Land for Maine Futures bond monies years ago. One of our um, most special places for us 
um, and uh, place, you know, favorite places for birding too with some of the beautiful um, uh, northern blazing star that you can see there in, in August, but a great place for seeing upland sandpipers and grasshopper sparrows and meadowlarks and sometimes bobolinks and lots of other really cool, cool birds. Um, I think are we time to wrap it up. I, I believe so. I guess so. We've we've really enjoyed spending time yeah. with with you today from our from our kitchen, and um, thanks for inviting us into your homes and lives. We hope you'll stay safe, and we look forward to um, when we'll be able to see you again in, uh, in in person, and maybe next time do this in front of you. Thanks. So thanks very much, Jeff and Allison, and uh, thanks everybody for for um, joining us today. And happy Earth Week! Uh, tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and um, NRCM has a few other webinars this week. On Thursday morning, from 10 to 11 a.m., we have a webinar about how to reduce food waste in our homes. Uh, and then on Friday morning, from 11 to noon, we're doing a webinar about climate change and clean transportation here in Maine. And you can find out more information and sign up for those webinars on our website, which is nrcm.org. Um, until then, have a happy Earth Day and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.